reading is from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 to 13. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return empty to me, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, good afternoon. And uh, if you're watching at seven o'clock on Zoom, good evening. Uh, it's really great to see you and uh, a, a great delight. As you know, um, we are looking at a series called Reset. And I'm very excited because Joe, my wife, uh, is sitting there. She told me she's got a, a notebook to take notes on my talk. So, I mean, we've been married for 30 years and it's amazing that, she, you know, it's amazing that she's still listening to what I have to say. Uh, anyway, I'll check them afterwards and see what... <laughs> Uh, so we're looking at reset, and we've been thinking about resetting ourselves with God and maybe breaking off some things in our lives which we want to break off so that we can reset ourselves properly and align ourselves properly with God. And over the next few weeks, we're going to think about resetting ourselves with the Scriptures, with the Bible. And uh, with one break for Climate Sunday, we're just going to look at the Scriptures for a while with the help of Andy Ollerton, so uh, many of you will remember Andy was our speaker at ENC side, the last one we were able to have. He's an absolutely brilliant communicator about the Bible, and he's coming in two weeks' time here at the four o'clock, but also uh, in June and July, he's going to do a Q&A on Zoom, which you can sign up for, and you definitely don't want to miss those either. So, going to be thinking about the Scriptures the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Christian Scriptures. It is the world's best-selling book and it, the most widely distributed book in the world. About five billion copies, people estimate, sold and distributed. It's uniquely popular and many say, Christians say in particular, that it's a uniquely powerful book as well. Within the book, it's got 66 compositions. 66 books within it. And if you split them up and you put them in a bookshop, then they would be in lots of different places in the bookshop because there's lots of different kinds of writings. So you've got eyewitness accounts, you've got letters, you've got visions, uh, you've got history, you've got wisdom writings, you've got songs and poetry, you've got prophetic oracles, you've got legal documents. There's a whole different kinds of things. And they've been collected together uh, about 40 different authors, uh, and they have a certain amount of different angles that they're bringing and different kinds of ways of writing, written in three different languages a long time ago, Hebrew and Greek and a little bit of Aramaic, and it covers the geography of around the Mediterranean as well as Mesopotamia, Egypt, Palestine, and so on, which we've been praying for again today. And uh, it's rooted in real places. Uh, which I think is an exciting thing. And those of you who visited some of these places, it's a real, you kind, of, you kind of feel like the Bible is coming to life as you go there. And you and I, these days, we read it translated, if you're English, into English. 500 years ago, William Tyndale gave his life to, to write it in the language that people could understand, as he said, so a plowboy could read it for themselves and, uh, and uh, meet with Jesus. And now it's obviously in book form. It's, you can have it on your phone or any other device in audio form, in film form. Some people have been watching The Chosen, I know. And there are countless commentaries, all kinds of books written over 2,000 years in particular, 
which help you understand what the Bible might be saying. Well, some of those books are more helpful than others, that's for sure. Um, it is the sacred text of the Christian faith. The Bible's always been central to the life of the Christian church. And if I read on the back, um, the little bit of blurb on the back, it says, it's epic narrative. Actually, it should be read in, you know, like film voice, shouldn't it? It's epic narrative. It's epic narrative reveals the nature of God, his love for humanity, and ultimate plan to redeem it through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible doesn't reference itself very much, but in various places, uh, it says a little bit about itself as Scripture. And in particular, St. Paul writes that Scripture is, in his word, and in the Greek it's one word, God breathed. God breathed. Theopneustos in, in Greek. And so what, it, what he's saying is it's been breathed by God, uh, and the breath of God is the Spirit. So in some way, this is the Spirit's book. It's the Holy Spirit's book. The Holy Spirit guided writers and editors and breathed into them so that we have the books that God wants. And he inspired them at source. And then as you and I open our Bibles, as you and I look at the Scriptures on our phones and that kind of thing, what you have is the Holy Spirit within you who shines his light on what you're reading and leads you into all truth. And as we do that together, uh, it's a very powerful moment. So what I want to ask, I want to ask maybe two or three questions around this as we think about maybe as we come out of lockdown, resetting ourselves not only with God and with Jesus Christ, but also with his book, with the scriptures. And the question is, how do you, how do you, I'm not going to ask you to say this out loud, how do you relate to this book? How do you relate to this book? Is it perhaps for you completely unrelatable? So uh, the survey group Comres did a survey about four years ago, which came up with the startling statistic that 55% of Christians never read the Bible at all, 50, more than half. It's too difficult, don't know where to begin, don't like what it says, seems to be irrelevant to my daily life, and so on. I don't know if you've seen that absolutely hilarious interview with Donald Trump when he was president, uh, and he's asked about what his favorite Bible verse was. Have you seen that? And, uh, I mean, you know, in, in answering questions sometimes, I thought Trump was a genius, and he says this. He, uh, he's asked for his favorite Bible verse, and he says, the Bible means a lot to me, but I don't want to get into specifics. And, and <laughs> you know, if you're a teacher, you've heard that answer, haven't you? When you've set some work and it hasn't been read, you know, I like it very much, but I don't want to get into specifics. In fact, uh, immediately after that, what happened was he was asked a very strange question, which is, are you an Old Testament guy or a New Testament guy? And he went, probably equal, <laughs> which, again, <laughs> you know, it's probably the only answer to give. So is it a really unrelatable book to you? And that's a possibility. Second, or it could be, it could be just a fascinating collection of ancient manuscripts, ancient literature. Uh, if you're at the uni, you may know Francesca Stavrakopoulou, who she's a, uh, a professor of Hebrew Bible, but she's also an atheist. So she absolutely loves the text. Um, but at the same time, uh, she, she says none of it is true. So you can have a great love for these texts and really enjoy the stories and really get into it, but not actually believe that any of it is true in any real sense. The third uh, possibility, the way you relate to uh, the Scriptures, is you could see it as having some very helpful parts in it. Um, parts that give you comfort. This is the Gideon Bible approach, and it's very effective. It helps people who are not yet believers understand that the Bible can speak to them in a very powerful way. But if you've been a Christian for a bit, it's slightly like taking medicine. So when you are feeling down or feeling difficult, you apply a certain verse to your situation. So if I'm afraid, I think of Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Or if I'm lonely, you think of Jesus saying, behold, I am with you always. Or if you're completely knackered, you go to where Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or if you've got an exam or if you've got an interview, 
you declare to yourself, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, this is, this is really good, but I don't think it's everything. It's very helpful, but I think the Bible offers something more than uh, receiving it as medicine. Because if you do that, you're, you are relating it simply to reading it according to your feelings. So if you want a mature relationship with the Scriptures, what I'm going to suggest to you is it somehow, the Scripture somehow has an innate authority to it for you, which God invites you to submit to. And I'll go into that in a little bit. Does this book somehow have an innate authority for you which God invites you to submit to? Now, let's think about authority for a few moments. Authority as a concept, particularly in our culture, is somewhat in the toilet, really. Pretty much all claims to authority these days are seen as power plays and tools of oppression because they inhibit freedom. And there, and there is a good critique for us as Christians to wrestle with around that. But our culture is really deeply into this. And has, you know, we have been influenced by this all the time I've been alive, since the 60s really. And we're obsessed with freedom as simply freedom to do what I want whenever I want, so long as it doesn't hurt anyone. And I would suggest to you that this is really the most minimal form of freedom. Because it's very possible to choose, I guess, stupidly and maliciously and to choose to do wrong things and bad things and evil things. So is it possible that there is a richer idea of freedom which comes from submission to authority where to be free is to be able to flourish as the glorious human being that God intends, increasingly unhindered by our own brokenness, by our own sinful impulses by our own ignorance and so on. Is it possible that this richer idea of freedom, freedom which comes from being under the authority of someone who is entirely good, is it possible that freedom is about voluntarily submitting to the authority of someone who is entirely good? So think of freedom in this way maybe. Two teams want to play a hard and free-flowing game of rugby. And so what they do is they submit to the rules and they submit to the spirit of the game, which is what you might call the authority. And without which, a, that kind of, a, without the rules and the spirit of the game, it will turn into a brawl on grass, if you like, which is unplayable, unwatchable, and uh, an unfree game. And so when you break the rules in rugby... It's called a foul, or it's called offside, or you get sent to the sin bin, or you, you incur a penalty, or you incur a sending off. All these words are really quite religious, to be honest. And if uh, the ref says to you that you're offside, it doesn't really work for me to say to the ref, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? And if the referee were a philosopher, he might reply, or she might reply, I'm the interpreter and the implementer of the authority which we've all decided together to submit to for the good of all. The referee probably isn't a philosopher, so they'll just book them for dissent. But you, you know what I'm saying. So the rules, the spirit of the game, which everyone voluntarily submits to because they want to play a good game, are the things that set the players free. So in our culture... Often authority is seen as a bad thing, often oppressive, often bigoted, often immoral, usually unpleasant. But I want to say to you, if you read the stories of Jesus, really one of the very first things that people were attracted to Jesus by and were amazed by him was his authority. The thing that drew people to Jesus was his authority. So when he taught and he spoke with such incredible wisdom, uh, people said, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. They absolutely loved that here was someone who seemed to say something, who was backed up by something, as it were, bigger than himself. And when he forgave sin, people were amazed and sometimes 
uh, if they were Pharisees, they were repelled by his authority. Or when he healed the sick, they were again astonished by his authority and they ran after him because of his authority. And when he drove demons out of people, again, people were set free by someone who spoke an authoritative word and people wanted that for themselves. And occasionally when he came across dead people, he would raise them and he showed that he had authority over death, over nature when he stilled the storms. And again, crowds ran after him. So true authority, godly authority... Beautiful authority is a phenomenally attractive thing. And yet, and, and our culture has got into a situation where most authority is seen as somehow difficult, at the very least. And at the end of Jesus' uh, life on earth, he says to his disciples this extraordinary statement. He says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Think about that for a moment. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, says Jesus. What an astonishing statement. I mean, if ever there was a statement where you have to think about yourself, uh, think about whether Jesus is mad or bad or God, that would be one of those statements. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So as we look around the earth... He has authority over all the earth. Now, just as an aside, he doesn't have control over everything. And if you are in the habit of saying God is in control, I don't think that is backed up by Scripture. God is in charge. He rules and he reigns. If he were in control, the world would look a little better. And I would suggest he wasn't doing a great job. He is not in control but he is in charge. He rules, he reigns, he's King Jesus. And I came across a, a, a thing recently where I was reading some ancient Christian texts. You know, that's what I, that's what I do. <laughs> um, and it's very well expressed here in a, in a letter from the church in Smyrna, which is in Turkey, um, talking about their bishop's martyrdom. Their bishop was killed and uh, his name was Polycarp. And I just thought it expressed very well the authority of Jesus. They said this, The blessed Polycarp was martyred on the second day of the first part of the month Xanthicus, the seventh day before the calends of March, a great Sabbath, at 2 o'clock p.m. He was arrested by Herod when Philip of Tralles was high priest and Statius Quadratus was proconsul, but in the everlasting reign of Jesus Christ. So everything comes under, all that terrible thing of the martyrdom of, of Polycarp just comes under the reign of Jesus Christ. He's not in control, but he is in charge. So how does Jesus, who has this fantastically attractive authority when people meet him, how does he exercise that same authority for you and me today? Well, some would say that's through the authority of the leaders of the church, say the Pope or whoever. Or some would say through the traditions of the church and, uh, that have been worked out over a couple of thousand years. And some would say through the application of human reason. But I guess what I'm suggesting to you in particular, and in our stream of church, we would say that he primarily exercises his authority through the scriptures, through the book that he has left us. And you can see that in Jesus, Jesus himself. So when Jesus was going around doing his stuff on the earth, he showed his own life in submission to the Hebrew Scriptures, which is the first half of this book, which was in existence when he was around. The second half was written later because it was about him. And you can see that Jesus submits himself in a number of ways. He's profoundly shaped by the Hebrew Scriptures, as were all good Jewish people at the time. And he was submissive to them, understanding, one, his own identity, who he was from the Scriptures, understanding his, his mission, what he was called by God to do through the Scriptures, and also adhering to the morality of the Scriptures, and he lived, a li he lived his life accordingly. He also debated with the, uh, uh, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, about the Scriptures continually, and he would take them to task. He would take the Pharisees to task for adding to Scripture. And he would take the Sadducees to task for subtracting from Scripture. 
They like to take the supernatural stuff out, which I would suggest is a mistake. And when he meets with the devil in the desert, he sees the devil off by using Scripture. It's obviously deep within him. He uses Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8 to say, look, it is written, X, Y, and Z, and the devil leaves him. So Jesus' relationship to Scripture is really um, powerfully submissive. And when when you submit to a good authority, then you become very powerful in yourself. So like with Jesus, the Bible... Both Testaments, Old and New, have always been central to the Christian church because it's the primary way, I want to suggest to you, that Jesus expresses his authority in our world so that we understand what's going on. And he speaks to us through it. So, you know, many of you will have had the experience as you read the Scriptures, you hear God speaking to you. What an extraordinary privilege. Uh, So people talk about the authority of Scripture. It's a phrase that's bandied around. And I guess uh, what really helped me was to hear Tom Wright, who's a writer about, uh, particularly about the New Testament, says this. He says, the authority of Scripture is really a shorthand for the authority of God expressed through Scripture. So the authority of Scripture is really a shorthand for saying the authority of God or the authority of Jesus Christ exercised through Scripture. So, just for a few moments, let's just slightly think of it in a different way. We've just celebrated uh, Ascension Day, that was last week, as we started to go into our 24-7, and when Jesus left the earth, he left the likes of you and me, his followers, with four things which would help us get on with uh, the Christian life and flourish in the Christian life. And those four things that Jesus left us are, one, the Holy Spirit, the power and the presence of God. Two, a community of followers, i.e. us as a body of people. And Jesus said that he would build his church. Number three, he left us the book, which eventually got written uh, sometime after he went, um, he rose from the dead. And the fourth thing he left us was the meal that we have, where we have bread and wine, and we remember the, uh, the benefits of Jesus' death in our, in our own present. So the spirit, the community, the book, and the meal, those are the things that Jesus left us. And really, you imagine that he envisaged the people gathering in the presence of the spirit, reading the book, and eating the meal, that that would be enough. That would be enough to cause us to grow. That would be enough to cause us to be transformed, to be set free. And it would be enough for us to change the world for good and see God's kingdom come where we are. And the role of the book, this book, would be to tell the story of God because it starts at the beginning of the world and it ends at the end of the world. So it's pretty comprehensive. Um, It would be the book which, through which we would hear God speak to us and that we would, he would speak to us in his attractive authority and through which our lives and actions would be shaped and, uh, and we would then go out and change the world. So in my life, as I've read the scriptures over the years, I've found that God has authority through his scriptures, number one, to tell me who I am. That's pretty radical in this culture. That I am a treasured and loved child of my heavenly father, rescued, set free, empowered to play my part in the story of God in this city. I've found that the Bible has authority to tell me what is reality, what is ultimate reality. And what really is ultimate reality is what God is doing in the world. It's got authority to tell me what constitutes a good life. It's one that reflects the beautiful nature of God and is filled with the love and the power of God. I found it has authority to tell me how to be a good person of which I am working hard to follow Christ, to do what he says and do what he does. And it has authority to tell me how to live my life, how to live my life well with others and with money and with sex and with power and all the things that kind of threaten to derail us. And because I trust, I do trust that God is entirely good 
and that he knows me better than I know myself, I willingly submit to his authority. I do my best to do that and his leading because in doing so, I am set free, I'm liberated. So the, the final question I have, and it is the most challenging question of all, it is to me, is really this, is as I reset myself for the future, do I really want to obey God? Do I really want to do that? Do I want to obey God as he expresses his authority through the Scriptures? Now, I know there's questions of interpretation, and in lots of ways you can almost make the Bible say anything you like. That's for another day. But essentially, it's, this is about a posture of the heart. Do I want to obey God as he expresses his authority through the Scriptures? Have I decided that if God seems to say something clearly to me through the Scriptures, that I'll believe it and do it? Because I think that is the proper, authentic posture, the proper, authentic relationship that God asks us and he invites us into with regards to this book that he has given us. So I want to finish with them. Um, being able to stand before God and pray together. And uh, the, sharp, the, the sharp-minded amongst you will, know, will notice that I haven't exegeted the passage at all, which in many places would be a thoroughgoing sin. But I want to uh, just speak the passage maybe a couple of times as we pray together and just invite you to see whether the Lord will lead you into submitting to his attractive authority through Scripture. Because I think that's the invitation for us. When we say Jesus is Lord, that means something. In our baptism vows, we say, I submit to Christ as Lord. And to submit sounds like a really terrible word, but it just basically means to let someone else lead you. And honestly, I can't think of anyone better to lead you and me than Jesus Christ. So should we stand for a few moments? And... Uh